And welcome to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana coming out of NYC at a True House Stories Karnak Power Record Studios for a special Sunday afternoon evening show with a close friend of mine. I know you probably play every week. He's got more friends than you can count. You damn right I do. And these people we hung tight with. And I hung very tight with this man for many years in many places around the world. We traveled and worked together, DJed, we laughed together, we cried together, we made fun of each other. <laughs> We've done it all. We even like, we were like, yo, man, you know, we kind of like break on each other because that's what family does. Yes. That's a mm-hmm. I'm gonna tell you something about this man. I'm very proud of him. He broke away from Basic Boys Productions, created his own situation called Quantize Records, and has made an empire out of it. <laughs> he, is an, he is a force to be reckoned with. He's a powerhouse. He does phenomenal music. Uh, <laughs> got a lot of on a turntable. The man's jumping around like a juju bee. Like, yeah! It's like, yeah! Yeah! He's going and going and going and going and going and going. It's like until he stops and he like decompresses, it's nonstop. He's got energy for days. Love him to death. I like you all put your warm hands together and welcome to True House Stories, DJ Spam. What's up? Lenny Fontana. Right. And welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome to the show of excellence. Thank you. Of broadcasting. Like I said, each and every week, we bring some amazing people. And he's yeah. right now in his studio in, in Baltimore, Maryland. He And he's put up nice <laughs> for us. So, yeah. and we start yeah. every way, every time, the same way. We all want to know right. how does music find a young DJ Spam? How does music find a young DJ spin? Because um, <laughs> I, I, well, um, it, 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 and and I'm I'm I think that this is a question that you ask sort of like in retrospect, like if I'm a young cat, right? How does music find this young dude named DJ Spin? And um, this young guy named DJ Spin found music, man. <laughs> At about probably three years old, something like that, something really, really young. Um, I I have pictures, and I wanted to use it for this album cover, but the one that I that I really wanted, I can't find. Th- where there's apparently there's some music playing in the background, and I am literally on my kitchen floor taking tops to pots, turning the pots, turning the tops over, and spinning the tops like I'm just sitting there, and they're like three and four tops. And I'm just spinning them and they're all around me and they're just turning as music is playing in the other room. And, uh, you know, they, they always taught me that as a kid, it was like, yeah, this, this cat is, is weird, man. You know, my brother was like, yo, what is going on with this dude? Um, but I've always been, there's always been turntables. It's kind of always happened. And then, you know, when I turned probably 10 years old or something like that, um, when the disco era was like in full bloom, man, I, I was I was on my way to to the record shop um, as my parents were in the market. I, I ran to the record shop and bought Evelyn Can- Champagne King's Shame, which was the first record I think I ever personally bought. But my brothers had everything around. You know, my brother was uh, one of them was always at Odell's here. And uh, Odell's was, a, uh, I guess, the Baltimore version of Studio 54, or more like, probably from what I hear, that the uh, Paradise Garage was something more like. Um, and, you know, I would hear records like, you know, Macho, uh, uh, you know, uh, not, not Macho, what, what was I Need a Man? Grace Jones and uh, Martin Circus, and like these records that I never heard on the radio. My brother would just bring them home and I would just study them. So, uh, that's how music really found me, man, I'm about 10 or 11. And then, you know, at 13, when hip hop came around, that was all she wrote, you know, oh, that was it. Hip hop, right? that was it. <laughs> yeah, man, that, that was it. So when I heard Rapper's Delight over top of one of my favorite records, basically it was over top of Good Times. I was, that was a rap. Couldn't even, couldn't even listen to disco again. You're like, ah, I'm done, right? 
Well, not really, because most of the most of the early hip hop records were based on disco. So, you know, whether you were listening to West Street Mob or uh, or, or Sequence Funk You Up, you know, I mean, all of these records were based on kind of like what was going on in the disco era, just, you know, with with a new with a new voice of a new generation coming around. And then, you know, then the Run DMC stuff happened and that changed it completely. LL Cool J Ebony just went somewhere else. But yeah, that that's how music found young DJ Spin sort of in a nutshell. So does DJ Spin have musical training? <laughs> ah, uh, no, not not no. Mm-mm. My like I said, my my mom was in a uh, my mom and her sisters had a gospel group that they toured around with. Um, in the, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, in Brooknell, Virginia, man, they would go from church to church and sing. And uh, my Aunt Louise, had, who has a voice on her, like, it's ridiculous, you know, would lead them in doing whatever they were doing. But, you know, so I, I kind of grew up, you know, with the whole church thing happening. My other brother was Jimi Hendrix. He played guitar. Um, so he was, he, was, he was always on a funk train somewhere. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, my other brother was into the R&B, the disco and all of that. So it was just a plethora of stuff happening um, as I was coming along. So I guess the only training I really had was just being submerged in it uh, one way or another. It just was always around. So formal training? No. Experience training? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes. Well, this is just as good. I mean, you had your brother playing electric guitar and wanting to be the next Hendrix. Yeah. And we all understand where the gospel influence comes from, the heavy gospel influence in your music. And now hearing that your mother sang. Yeah. So that is yeah. enough, as a young child to be etched. Your DNA is gospel down. It's- yeah, it is. It is. It was just kind of a natural progression. You know, when we started doing this whole 4-4 house thing, well, we're not and, even, you know, yet. Four, four house. We, you still live we, in Cisco in Curtis <laughs> Blow. Because for me, Curtis <laughs> Blow was all about these are the breaks. Get it up. Yeah, that's right. And you would hear like, right. a go beat behind it. And he made it. Yeah. Cool, right. Yeah. That that was the thing, you know, from from. Uh, and, and I really kind of, you know, I've, I've heard stories about like Grandmaster Flash and, you know, like all of the, you know, the, the B-boy guys and stuff. And the one thing that, that was very similar to me is being, you know, being a catholic school kid in baltimore wow. that catholic school boy yes sir you all, all, you all, all of no. <laughs> c-a-t-l-i-c-k catholic school yeah but you but you gotta understand they hit with a book on my head <laughs> like book she used to say to me you're a motor mouse bam yeah. Well, you see where your motor mouth got you. Well, got I, you I want to tell that. No, I, want to, I want to drag. <laughs> say, yeah, you want to tell her thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, tell tell her, everybody tell in my in my report card. He's a motor mouth. Wow. <laughs> oh, because I like to be so, I'm very socialistic. But anyway, so you went to Dude. Catholic school. So what was that yeah. like? <sighs> very interesting. Um in a lot of ways, because even though I went to Catholic school, I was raised, everybody around me was Baptist. So, exactly. <laughs> it was, it was wild, you know, man, you know. Explain to everybody what that means, that everyone with the world music and everything, the worldly music and being Baptist all around you, trying to. Yeah. Be- nah, man, it was like, um, my, I, I, you know, I, I have to, I have to give my parents credit. I really do. because. They again, they they were from a little my, my father was from a town called Red House, known for some red barn that's in the dang on town. That's about it. And my mom was from the town called Brook Neal. So these two towns are so small that going to church was what they did for recreation, almost kind of. You know, I mean, it was a thing. You were in church Mon- you know, I mean, Sunday all day. Then it was, you know, Wednesday, then Friday, then, you know, rehearsals and everything Saturday and then church on Sunday all day. So it was um, it was sort of a way of life. But when my dad broke out, came up here to Baltimore in the 50s to go to work at Bethlehem Steel, you know, I, it's a totally different thing. So now we you know, my my brothers who are both kind of 
13 years older than I am. You know, my second brother's 13 years. I, I, I'm, I was kind of like, you know, well, I suppose, am I supposed to be here or am I not? I, I don't know. I don't know whether I was in the plan. But, um, you know, I mean, my parents, man, allowed them a certain type of musical freedom in the house, you know? So I heard Motown, you know, I, I heard Stax. I heard, you know, what was going on with, you know, Aretha and everybody, you know, in, in, the, in the Atlantic stall. You know, they, they were real heavy into the funk and, and all of it. So, um, yeah, man, but, but the church, yeah, the Baptist church, hardcore. It's like, um, yeah, you can't, well, you couldn't. This has changed, thank God, in a lot of ways. But back then, man, they were just hardcore. If, if, uh, you know, if it, if it didn't come from church, it wasn't church. It just ain't church. You know, it's, it's, it's secular. It's of the devil. Um, so, you know, even though we had to be really careful, uh, about what we were doing and, you know, my parents, my father was hardcore boy. Let me tell you, if Sean did something, anything, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> James Spencer was coming with it. Bow. It's over with. And that it, I'm telling you now, man, that that was nothing to play with. So always with respect. But we were able to do some things um, and, and play music and really, really play music at home. And, and, and you know, with me, like I said, my, my brothers were, were older, but it seemed like every mistake that they made with them. They weren't letting me make any of those mistakes. So it was Catholic school, state, uh, Catholic school, and you go into church. <laughs> you know, if you're not playing a sport, then you go into church. And that was it. Church. That was it. Church. What church? Church. church. Whitestone Baptist Church was the church I went to here in Baltimore. Went, and like I said, it, it was. Wait, it, I went to Catholic school, but you went to Baptist church. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I remember some of the kids in my class, it's the same problem. And the way they taught in the Catholic school comparing to how the Baptist way of doing things is a little different. Ain't no little. It's world's different. It's completely different. The rituals right. are different. They're hugely different. Yeah. But yeah, well, <laughs> it, it's interesting because I, I, I'm really very careful. I, I don't really call myself a Christian. I'm a Christ follower, but that's a whole nother thing because of what they have done with the word Christian. You know, Baptist is Christian. Catholic is Christian. Protestant is Christian. And, and th so it's, it's a lot of moving parts there and a lot of things that I don't believe. So I'm more so a Christ follower than I am a a Christian. I'm really kind of careful with that, but that's a whole nother thing. Anyway, religion, but we understand though. We get, we understand. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I, I came up confused. Like a lot of people are just confused. It's, it's a, it, it, uh, you know, and I think they try to, conf a, a lot of this confusion is almost like it's on purpose, um, to kind of keep you from what the truth really is. Um, so that, uh, being what it is, it's uh, it, it, it was tough trying to trying to navigate both worlds. Um, it was tough. It was it was it was just a tough thing. But uh, lo and behold, here comes in about 1982. Uh, you know, like I said, me, uh, <laughs> 1982. My mom's my mom is um, really you know she she's working as an occupational therapist. My dad was a steel steel mill worker, and. Um, I'm listening to the radio station that James Brown used to own here, which was called WEBB, Little AM Radio Station. And they were playing, man, like this, this, this group called the AP Crew, right? Now, they said at the time they were from New York. They weren't. They actually were from Columbia, Maryland, furthest thing from New York. I think they may have had a couple of guys who had family in New York, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, man, I'm hearing these guys mix. I'm like, what in the world is mixing? Hoo hoo. What is that? So I go and I have my little one turntable, Pioneer PL4. You talking about the technique? You I had a Pioneer PL4 <laughs> belt drive turntable and one boom box. That's right. And Talk about <laughs> <laughs> what's that PL4? Like, did it even have pitch adjust on that PL4? It did, it did. But you know, the, the, the little one on the at, in the front that you kind of, you know, the little All pitch right. wheel. Um 
So anyway, yeah, the, the the way you knew if your record was on time is if you could get the the lights to be solid. <laughs> you know, if the light is solid, you're good. If it's slow, it's slow. If it's fast, it's fast. Whatever. Um, so anyway, I heard them do something that I'd been playing with a long time. So I'd been like taking good times on this pause button deck and making good times the break longer than it was. And I just, you know, I really got kind of decent at it. So I heard them doing what they were doing. I went and I bought a little teeny Gemini mixer. And I had that boom box, that mixer, and that turntable. And I just started going to work, right? Came up with this little eight-minute master mix of Orbits. And the beat goes on. <laughs> <laughs> and did some little things to ask you it, right? how the pausing and edits were from that time you would listen to it now. You probably like... <laughs> Oh, I do. Because, cause like, man, look, so online, there are quite a few guys, man, that used to, to, that used to record the stuff we used to do on a radio station here. And I would listen to that stuff and be like, oh, gee, that's terrible. That's terrible. And they just love it. It's like, okay, cool. I mean, before back then, I guess it was whatever it was. But, you know, it's like little Latin Rascals kind of style stuff. But it's not as clean as the Latin Rascals. Yeah, right. you know, Latin Rascals would use tape. No tape editing. You know, <laughs> you're doing it with a cassette machine. So when you're hitting the pause, you're getting the space, uh, you know, you bring it back a little bit. It's like they're a little bit like uh, 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 the edits were mm-hmm. not on beat. So you but that was what made it magical. I guess so, because people love them. And um, yeah, so I did my first one, man, and I remember I, I begged my mom. Right. I think I had been What'd you punished. Tell I think I've been punished. I must have gotten like a D on something. So they 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 punished me. And one day, you know, I just got to doing what I was doing. And I said, Mom, look, you got to take me to this radio station. I want to take this tape to this guy. Cause they're playing these things on the radio. And I think I got something this close. And she said, Okay. She finally broke down, and said, All right. She said, All right. And yeah, she said okay. So she uh, we got in the car, man. My friends, black moms. <laughs> you can see them for weeks. They were on lockdown. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, they, like I said, my parents were always working. So a lot of times, you know, I mean, even at a young age, I was home by myself and my brothers weren't there and stuff, you know. But you know, my brothers, one of my brothers was more like a father to me because my parents was, were so much older than I was. Um, so, you know, I mean, he always, you know, looking out for me, you know, teaching me how to balance checkbooks and stuff, you know, really when I was young, that kind of thing. So he, he was, yeah, my, yeah, my, my brother's serious. So he was the one who was working in the electronic stores and was able to get me the electronic stuff. I mean, one of these amps I still have from when he was working in Luskins. <laughs> this is what it was called, Luskins. So anyway, he, um, no, no, no. My mom takes me to the uh, the radio station. I take the tape to the guy, right? The, I mean, you know, the classic kind of thing. You know, we sat there for about 15, 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. My mom's like, if he don't come on, we gonna roll. I said, all right, this is this whatever. At least you bought me. So then he comes out, man, you know, with his with his suit and his bow tie, you know, walking, you know. Three piece. <laughs> yeah. Then he comes out, he's like, watch on the man, side here the- like this. Give, give you five minutes. <laughs> So, you know, he looks at me like, yeah, young blood, what you got? So you got something here? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you know, all right, man, you know, I, so I'll check it out, man. You know, I, I, I'll be in touch, man, you know. And, and you know, I, I think my mom was like really impressed with the fact because, you know, he even came out and even talked, you know, spoke to us. Wow. So that was cool. And, um, you know, I gave him the tape and that was it. Now. WEBB was only on. It was one of those AM radio stations that when it when when the when the morning came up, well, when the sun comes up, EBB comes on. When the sun goes down, no matter what time of year it is, EBB is off. So if the sun went down at four, EBB is off. If the what? sun went down at, I don't know. I still don't know what the idea was. But this this was the type of a station. And I, I find out that there were several radio stations back then that that operated like that you know i mean it comes when the sun's up it's on when the sun's i don't know anyway so tomorrow well, morning when the sun's up tune in <laughs> 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 Shut down and stab it, everyone remember 
6 to 4.30, you don't catch us then, we're off the air. Right, we're off the air. Yep, you would turn it on, man, at like midnight and there would be nothing. And then it would just come on, you know, they would play the Pledge of Allegiance or something in Rome. After two o'clock in the morning at home, they used to bring the flag up. And they, yeah. would, and they would go, Ooh. Exactly. And exactly. they would be like, now what? We don't, The late, late, late show's over. It's, it's nothing. Yeah, like, oh, man. Then, then, then there'd be nothing. You'd be seeing test bars. <laughs> test bars and Ooh. So, Ooh. um. So I'm rushing home because, I mean, it's, it's, it's wintertime. And I remember being kind of close to my birthday. Um, so, you know, it, it, being wintertime, the sun goes down earlier. So EBB would go off earlier. So, man, I would, uh, I would rush home. And, uh, and this is after basketball practice or something crazy. So rush home, get in the house, turn on EBB. And I kid you not, I turned it on and my mix was playing as I turned it on. I said, what is happening? So now, of course, now, of course, I'm calling the request line, you know, with the old phone, you know, dialing and dialing. Can't get through. Can't get through. An hour later, can't get through. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the station's about to go off and he answers. And I say, dude, you played my mix on air. He's like, oh, it's Young Love from yesterday. Oh, man. You know, that mix set, that was pretty good. It's pretty good. You know, you got some more in you. And I'm like, I got nothing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got more. He's like, all right, well, what's the name of your crew? I said, crew. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I looked at, at the time, right? And, and at the time, right, I had moved from the little Gemini to a new Mark mixer, still small new Mark mixer. I looked over at the mixer. He's asking me the question. And the words, the new Marks came out of my mouth. He's like, all right, man, so the new Marks, man, we're going to expect some more from you, et cetera. We hear some more of what you got. That was it. <laughs> so hey so how many times so wait 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 so now you became your crew your tag name was the new marks yeah that was it n-u-m-a-r-x we took the k off I, I was i was scared of being sued by the mixing company you actually really thought that too you were actually thinking about being sued man heck yeah i was like yo i'm hoping them cats don't come after me i'm just a kid yeah but but i mean but but now i mean a i told the dude a uh, kind of fabricated thing i don't have a crew that's first <laughs> two you, you got some more music now i ain't got nothing else so i'm so now i gotta scramble i gotta make more figure it out so Man, and, and, and man, in the early days, the, the new marks went through a couple of different versions. First, it was me and my two cousins. Then my two cousins fell off. And then it was me and two guys from, from my middle school. Uh, then, then we added one other guy um, who was the cousin of one of, of Cool Rod. So it was me, Cool Rod, Junie Jam, Beatmaster Moses. And then we added Kevin Lyle. <laughs> Kevin Lyles was the last piece and that was how the new box was basically formed so were you getting DJ gigs now like to play parties because off of this AM radio station airing thing <laughs> at that you know point saying? you know because now yeah. you're, you're like the new one for break for a yeah. crew it's like you get the new box to come and DJ the first gig that I had that the, the the radio station thing happened in I think September 82 the first gig that I had um was as the new marks it was me and Beatmaster Moses and we were opening for this cat named Davy DMX who had a record called one for the treble out of New York wow and yeah. um yeah that was my first my first gig December 19. 19- 82. Keep on. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> D train era. 82, baby. That's D. 82. So yeah, wait, that D train so, down. So, where did you perform? On a stage or was it like a gymnasium thing? What was no, it? No, it was it, it was at the Baltimore Civic Center at the time. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. That? So, it was it, it was a pretty it was a pretty hefty gig. It was wild. I mean, it, and, and it, it's weird because it was, it was so, uh, 
it was so intimidating to a point, especially my, my partner. Now, remember, I told you I pulled together this thing. Right. You just, all of a sudden, you just made it. Yeah, just, just, just pulled it together, right? I mean, my, the, my partner at the time, Moses, he couldn't even really mix. And literally, he froze in front because we worked out this routine and everything. And he froze. And I was like, oh, man, I got to keep doing something. So we just, it was, it was, so wait, it was wait, wait, wait. insane. Is it like Beach Street, the movie where, you know, the guy, you come in and the crowd's going like this. And you're like, you know, when the guy's scratching. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, you yeah. Twelve hundred. So you do have not inferior twelve. We had four PL four Pioneer turntables. We insisted on having the same gear, all of us, and that's what we went and we did that gear with. Turntable scratching. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah, and of course, Davey DMX came on and he did what he did. Um, which you know, I was just like fascinated. Like, okay, he's got that and that and that. So now I'm uh, now I'm really learning what's going on. It's like, I said, we opened for the guy, so you know, we came on. Apparently, we did okay because they kept calling us back and we kept working. But do you remember in those days when you first saw the twelve hundred and how awesome it looked? You must have been like, whoa, when you saw that. Dude, I, 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 I saw like Davy DMX doing some things because, like, I, look, I didn't even know. Like, you know, like, you know, the, the DJs would have like the felt pads or, you know, they, they, they would take, you know, like the, the, co- the inside plastic covers and put right. holes in them. And, and, you know, you go scratching and, you know, that whole thing. Yeah, um, right. Man, I was, I was still using the rubber felt to do what I was doing, to do what we were doing. We were using the rubber. F- I'm telling you, man, it, it was like it was it was I was working, but school was in session. I looked at Davey DMX and was like, OK. This is what we need to do. Right, we need to step see up where this is going. You were saying mm-hmm. we need to step this up right away. Yeah, yeah. But understand, Lenny, I was 13. My, you know, talking to my parents about getting some some 1200s. I didn't have 1200s until three years later. We were working those PL4s, man, for about three years straight before I was Wait, able to stop this, man. move on. Where the hell's Pioneer right now? We should be enjoying <laughs> Just on, just on the PL4. You hear this, everybody? He's had a pioneer belt driven turntables. That's yeah. not he's playing like the red bride wannabe turntables. He's playing like pioneer belt driven. That means the plat is doing this when he's touching. So it's going like this because any weight to that thing on a belt driven mm-hmm. goes clang to the little moon. Yeah. It had like the yeah. clang, like you know, what I'm right? Saying? Like that's rough. right, and but but that wasn't the thing. It was the straight arms, the it, straight, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the straight arms, not not the S arm, the straight ahead arms. Mm-hmm. So man, we were doing some really interesting things with that setup, um, and and which is very interesting because then, like I said, school was in session. B- believe it, or not, we were doing whatever we were doing, and and and, and you know, the kids around here were doing were were you know really into what we were doing. You know, we were doing a bunch of the high school parties and, you know, I mean, we were like freshmen and we were doing like all the senior parties and stuff. It was crazy. Um, but then... And then I bet then, you becoming the heroes of everybody too because in those days, your peers would love you guys even more because you became like d- neighborhood celebrities. Yeah, it was... Not, it, not it, on it was, level, but just... It, 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 you know, you're right. Boy, that could play on the turntable. He's fresh. Yeah, He's dude, you're right. Fresh. Because He's, yo, don't get fat. it twisted. I was yo, I was a nerd from the herd. Don't get it twisted. My, I told you, my parents didn't let me do anything. Being able to DJ a was my way of getting out of the house. You know, I mean, I I actually, if I was out DJing until two or three in the morning. They wouldn't make me necessarily go to church some of those times, but boy, if I had to go, they would be like, oh, came home at three, still got to go. <laughs> still got to go. But sometimes they would have mercy on a brother, depending on what time it was. But the facts really were, um, you know, hey, man, it's Sunday. We going to rock and roll. Get up. Let's Wait go. Get up. Get up. Get up. Yep. Clap your hands. Get up. Let's go. Get up. Mm-hmm. Clap your hands. Get up. Right. Come on. Come on. But yeah, so, so it was. Uh, ends, that's how it was. I know you wrote records and stuff. High school ends. You go on. You go into mm-hmm. college level stuff. You start well, to- no, still in high school, man. Look, 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 look. In high school, I would, I would w- think when I was a junior at this point was when Jazzy Jeff came to town and the Fresh Prince. Woo! That's a big thing, man. 
Big thing, man. Man, Jack he came down here. Yeah. yeah. He came down here to Afram and taught a brother some lessons. I was like, what? Because I, now I had heard him, man, because, you know, we had family up, up on Long Island. And every now and again, my, my parents would, you know, we would take the drive from here and go up there. And I would just be fascinated with what I would hear on New York radio, blah, blah, blah. Man, one Sunday, we came back from New York. Sunday afternoon, I'll never forget. And I turn on the AM, you know, I'm surfing. All of a sudden, I hear this cat, the Fresh Prince, is talking on the radio with this cat, Jazzy Jeff, doing some unspeakable things, the records in the back of him. I'm like, what is he doing? And I was like, okay, well, they have to be live because, you know, like I said, we were putting things together with this pause button situation we had going on, right? But he was doing some things that sound like some pause mixing going on, but he was doing them live. I'm like, he talking on this stuff. It's completely different. So when they were co- when they came to town, buddy, I was glued to the front. Like, what are you doing? And I'm watching Jazzy Jeff transform, backspin. I was just like, okay. It's uh, school time, for real. Yeah, you And did. next thing you know, yeah, so I, I, I practiced those moves, man, for months. <laughs> for months and months and months. Like I was in, like literally like I was in school. Wake up in the morning, work from six to seven, finish at seven o'clock, get ready to go to school. Come home. And back at it, doing this stuff that Jazzy Jeff was hey, doing. Everybody, how many hours were t- <laughs> put into this? Like hours were endless. He, hours. He wanted. He wanted to become great, no matter what it took. He would practice and practice. And yeah, so so needless to say, I, I probably became the first guy that was doing anything similar to what, to what Jeff and Cash Money and all those guys were doing. Um, and at this point, you know we. Like I said, we, we, we ended up being a five-man crew. When Kevin Lyles came around, we started, you know, we started to add the MC element to what we were doing. So between him and Cool Rod, they were our front men. And we would have, man, I claim the fame, Lenny, I kid you not, with eight turntables. We had eight turntables rolling, two MCs, and all of a sudden the New Marks was a real bona fide crew that would go around and do skating parties, man. Shoot, we opened up for... For uh, um, LL, um, uh, Fat Boys, um, which geez, man, like you name it. If they came through here, we opened up for them. Heavy D and the boys. If they came through Baltimore between probably like eighty four and eighty five, we we rolled with them. The EPMD whole nine. That was crazy. It was nuts. Wow. See, I didn't know that. I had no idea about that. Yeah. How long? Yeah, that it was nuts. For? How long did that go on for? About two years. And um, like I said, and, and in between, and, and while all of that was going on, now we're starting to go into the studio. I kid you not, man, we did we, we did a record called The Rhythm Machine. And I think I still have it around here on a cassette somewhere. And The Rhythm Machine, we sampled Bob James' Take Me to the Mardi Gras. And we just thought that that thing was going to be the next best thing since sliced bread because, I mean, we killed it. We refined it. And then here comes Run DMC with Peter Piper. (laughs) 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 We we just said, oh, man, okay. That idea. Yep, that that idea is gone. No matter how good it was, you know, it's Run DMC. Now everybody's just going to think you're biting and that's done. But in the midst of all of this, man, we came up, we, we worked with this guy, man, out of Annapolis, a um, guy named Bill Petaway. And he had this track that was the layout, was the groundwork for this song called Girl, You Know It's True that we did. And uh, we loved what he did so much. He was getting ready to throw it away. He didn't want to use it. Um, but we convinced him to use it. We went to the studio, man, in D.C. We recorded it Who was and the- put that thing out. Who was the singers in the girl you know is true? Who's the singers? All right. So one guy tells the story in the Baltimore side before it goes international. Who's <laughs> singing it in the back end? All right. So what 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 initially happened was, you know, like I said, we 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 went to the studio, we laid it out, it was all laid out. Kevin and Rodney did their raps, 
And Kevin was kind of like, OK, look, dude, we need to sing. We need to sing this part. So he started coming up with the hook. We started joining in. We made this hook. Girl, you know, it's true. I love this for you. And that was kind of like what we established for the hook. We went to the studio and we tried to sing it. Buddy, we could not do it. We weren't singers. <laughs> we, were, we, we were MCs and stuff. And we had this one guy, and I can't remember his name. So we had this one singer, man. He came in, and he, he was like the glue to the whole entire thing. So now it's me, Kevin Lyles, and this guy, and we singing the Girl You Know It's True part, and now we got it sounding decent. In comes a cat named Kaya Demo, who is the writer, and, and actually I think, the, I think he was one of the, the lead members that put together Starpoint, Object of My Desire, right? So he was really good friends with the guy that produced the record. They come in and, and they're like, okay, cool. Here's what this record, the, 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 this record needs a hook, a real hook. So we were like, okay, man, we young. We're like, okay, well, it is a hook. We got a sing along part. He's just saying the part. He was like, nah, we're going to go and we're going to do blah, blah, blah. So, you know, like, like producers normally do, y'all are artists, go away. Let us come up with what we come up with. Kai came up with the part. We came in. He heard this girl, you know, it's true. Ooh, 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 I love you. We we're like, okay, cool. We went in, we sang that part, pulled it all together. Now you got, girl, you know, it's true. We put it out, it becomes this regional hit. What I mean, like Virginia. Pick the record, who picked up the record over on this side? A, a label in DC called Studio Records. That's who we recorded for. And, um, you know, I mean, I dude, he has. <laughs> check this out. Stay, stay now. Stay with this because this is going to get where True House Stories really finds out the serious. I know. Yeah. Stay with yeah, this. You, yeah. You got. Gonna you got. Out. You got the dirt now. You're going to find out what what happened <laughs> behind the music. Behind the music. Here we go. Right. Okay. So we do the record. We put the record out. The record becomes this regional hit on Studio Records. Um, so we have people in Baltimore, people in D.C., people in Virginia. Um, it probably went down as far as Virginia Beach and probably up as far as Philadelphia. And, you know, it, it, it did great. But we thought as a group that it should have been doing better. The label that we were with was a small label. He had limited resources. And, um, you know, he didn't know what he was doing. I mean, I think everything from the management to the record label, everybody that we were with just had no idea what they were doing or how big this actually could get. And neither did we. Next thing you know, the record label calls us and he says, hey, man, I got this crew in Germany that's calling me that wants to pick up the record. But it's like really for no money. They want to get they want to take the record for like eight grand. And I'm, I don't think that we should take it. At, dude, I'm young at the time. I'm like, eh, you are out of your mind. You need to go and take that because now we can... You talking about us going to Germany and going somewhere and getting on the German label? You better do that. That was all we heard about it. We didn't hear nothing else, right? So, Lenny, we still going around with doing what we do on New a local Marks level. Still, New Marks is still New fresh. Is, New Marks is still fresh. Death. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do what we do. Five, eighty-six. Right? Yep. Ha! Ah, must have been getting to be summer of eighty-six. I get a call. That's right. Now I lived. Now I lived in Baltimore City. Um, and the rest, everybody else lived in Baltimore County. Baltimore County had cable. Baltimore City didn't have cable yet. That's right. Okay. But he was still waiting for the cable to come to town. Right. So. I'm the only one that's out as far as cable is concerned. Both phones are still in fashion. <laughs> Touchstone was an amenity for an additional expense in your house, if I remember correctly. Oh, this is why I guess people like you, because you are out of your mind. This is the gone. truth. You have to remember that. <laughs> have to yeah. Remember. This is difficult times, guys. My father yeah. said to me, give me the goddamn phone right now. I need to make a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, we got the phone. With it. Do, 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 do. it was like it was fierce that you had a phone now that you could quickly go with a redial button. That was yeah, like, no. It was it, man. That was it, it was next level. Things were 
Man, it was next level. Being able to call a radio station every day and just hit redial and, yeah, right. and, and go <laughs> rather than having to go. That's right. So, so the guy so, sells anyway. the record to Germany and you guys he, do your well, well, he well, he he claims he never sold it to never. Germany. Oh, he never licensed it. He, he claims he didn't do it. Right. Okay. He told, that's what he told you. That's what he told us. He said it wasn't enough money. That's exactly what he said. And then that was that. All right. So <laughs> I get a phone call in 86. Yo, man, the, uh, we, we hear your record on the, on the radio. Uh, somebody, somebody stole your record. I mean, it's your record, but it's not you. I said, say what? And, and, and of course, because I didn't see it, I didn't believe it. I'm like, ah, this is whatever it is. Right. But I kept getting the calls. They just, they just kept coming and I kept deny, deny, deny. Right. Really? Until one day I turn on, like I said, man, all we had ABC, NBC, CBS. Some one of those stations had some video show, man. I turn on the radio and I see these two dudes with long hairs jumping around singing, girl, you know, it's true. And I'm like, oh boy, this is interesting because see, you had to look at it from, from my Give us your Our point of view. Yeah, give us two from your vision. Right. Our point of view was that our record company couldn't take us to that level to even do a video. Right. Here, these guys are coming doing our song with a video and a killer video with dancers and hold up. And it's not, and they're not using our version. We would have never done that song that way. Right? So now, not only, not only is that happening for me, now you got to understand that the, the type of the type of thing that I was feeling was they stole your record. You punked out. They st- I mean, we heard all kinds of stuff. We heard all kinds of stuff. Oh, I bet. I you mean, some stuff I can't I, I can't even. Yeah, it was like, it was like. Yeah, y'all let y'all let those dudes no, hear y'all music. You all let like it was up to you to let that happen. Yeah, How did exactly. You let that happen. Yep. How that's exactly what that it was. Happen? Hang on a second. It's having a little more drink. I want to I want to share, give everybody a quick second. I want to read re- again. People are gagging right now. But while we're at it, <laughs> from the week we got Freddie Turner. Come on, y'all. You're up in there. You're seeing the numbers. And Marsha Stern and Robbie Leslie on the 24th. Miss, <laughs> Mr. Freddie Turner on the 17th. Freddie Turner. Make sure you tune in. And one other thing. Hold on. I need all of you to help us like PBS. Subscribe to our newsletter. Oh, <laughs> wrong. Hang on. I'm, I'm going away by the story. You better sell it, boy. <laughs> Subscribe to our newsletter. Please share it. Yes. Share and subscribe and stay with us all the time. <laughs> TrueHouseStories.com is here for you each and every week with some special Sundays. We give it to you. You got that water down? You got, you're all good? You got that call? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Going back to the Millie Pinnacle story, which is, this is incredible to hear it from his mouth. Because I've heard yeah. it over a couple of drinks, but to hear it like this is perfect. Yeah. So yeah. all your homies are calling you saying, how could you, how could you let this happen? What's wrong mm-hmm. with you? And you're going, mm-hmm. you're going damn it. Damn it. Then <laughs> <laughs> you try to explain it. And they're like, yeah, right. <laughs> no, nah, nah, to these dudes around here, it wasn't no explaining. They saw what they saw and they knew what they knew. So it was, so it, it was, man, it was, it was like, at that point, it was like disappointment after disappointment after disappointment after, I mean, just so many different things. And I, I, I and I, yeah, so it, it, it was, man, shoot, I can get into a bunch, but, um, we were, we were devastated in a lot of ways. And the bad thing is that, you know, we, we never really had an outlet to really kind of talk about it. We just kind of was like, okay, well. It is what it is. We just kept doing what we were doing. You know, I mean, we kept 
trying to prove ourselves, you know, going doing gigs and 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 functions and weddings and you know, we, we wait, just wait, we just wait, kept wait, doing brother, what we doing. Brother man, did they actually steal the re- what? What no. people part of it? Can you give us a leak? You understand the music industry, so now yeah. you speak on the music industry side. What exactly went down? What was um, the what? What really- they 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 heard the record. Okay, right. They loved the record. I mean, the record. The record, from what I understand, the record had been um, signed to Cool Tempo. Okay, and we didn't know. OK, so so not only that, we had a previous single called Rhyme So Deaf, which was also signed to a label. It was signed to a label in London or picked up by a label in London and a label in Germany. So we never knew that. We didn't even know that that happened. So there was and, a third party licensing deal that happened that uh-huh. you just signed. You just signed the Baltimore contract and you didn't know anything further. Nope. So all of this is going on unbeknownst to us. OK. Gotcha. Then figure you guys, then, bucks, they figure you're young bucks and, and green around the ears. You ain't going to find out nothing. That's what they're thinking. Go right. ahead. And, and uh, man, so we, we saw this video and it was like, OK, so we kept on working and kept on working. And I think a lot of the dynamic of the group had changed as well, um, because we went from being a five man group down to a three man group. Um, and, and like I said, you know, 86 was when we graduated from, well, when I graduated and I was the youngest of the group. So I graduated from high school and was about to enter into college. So now you've got a whole nother dynamic of stuff that's happening. Okay. Um, we, we wanted this to happen. It didn't happen for us. It seems to happen for somebody else. Our work and our time. Okay, fine. But now we've got work we've got jobs we've got school you know like real school like you know college and everything's going on so we just kept kind of going on with with life 